losing that person. It's not that we can just glibly say, well, it's for the glory of God, just carry on. I mean, we could sort of do that and maybe, maybe like Job. Think of Job's story. What Job went through when his children were all wiped off the face of the earth, I mean, almost instantly, and he lost tremendous loss, tremendous suffering. We can't even imagine getting hit like that from all sides like Job was. And in the beginning it says, and all this, Job did not sin with his lips. It begins that way. He did. He did accept it at first. But it's interesting when you read just a little bit further, just several verses after it says he did not sin with his lips, it says, and, and sometimes you don't notice this in the English, but it's clear in the Hebrew, it says, he, then he opened his lips and began, and from that point on, Job begins questioning like any of us would. He begins cursing the day of his birth. Why, God, why, why would you do this to me? And if you look carefully at the interaction between Job and his friends and all, of course, their errors and everything else, but you see, you see Job just struggling within with the reality of loss and death and struggling with the God who is sovereign over it. That's what you see. And that's the case with all of us. So, so Jesus is here speaking truth. Jesus is not flustered. He, he is not, oh, what do we do now? My friend is sick. What are we going to do? He is not at all. He is completely calm. He knows exactly what's he, what he's going to do. And still there is something for humans, Mary and Martha in this instance, Lazarus himself in this instance, we ourselves and our lives to, to wrestle with this idea, wait, there, there is something beyond. There's something beyond just the physical, something beyond just the experiences of sickness and death. There, there's, there's a divine purpose. There's divine glory involved in some way. He says this is for the glory of God. So we're going to dig into this morning. What does that, what does that even mean? What's that mean and how does that help us and how does that magnify God's amazing grace toward us? So let's continue reading. It gets even a little bit more strange here because in verse 5 it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. He loved them. Verse 6, So he loved them. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, He then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now, what would you expect to read? Jesus loved them. Jesus loved Lazarus. So, when he heard he was sick, he went immediately and healed him. That's what we would expect to read, isn't it? That's what would make sense. That's how we would understand love in that situation. Go and help the guy. But it says, instead, he stayed back two days longer. Interesting. It's definitely a little bit confusing. You can understand that there was confusion. Jump ahead to uh, verse 11. I'm not going to look at all the details here because last week we covered many of these and next week there'll be some more, but just look at uh, verse 11. This he said, it's Jesus, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. They're not understanding exactly what's going on. He said, Oh, if he's just sleeping, he'll be fine. Verse 13, now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Now, think about that for a moment. Earlier, remember, he said this is not to end in death. Here he admits, oh yeah, Lazarus, he's he's dead. Hmm. And I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And it's again, just curious, interesting. I'm glad I'm glad that he died. I mean, if you're thinking carefully, this is what he says. I, I, I'm rejoiced, literally, I, I rejoice that he died because there's something else going on here. I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you may believe. You see, you see there's something else coming that's, that makes it worthwhile. This is what he's leading them toward. So he waits to go to Lazarus. He makes this declaration. And they are, understandably, confused now where we are in the story is Lazarus is dead okay so Lazarus has passed away the the fears of Martha and Mary and any other friends have have come true that he's gone time has gone by jump down to verse 21 just note that the frustration coming out of Martha and then we'll notice Mary's frustration as well but start in verse 21 Martha then said to Jesus Lord if you had been here my brother would not have died what are you doing why didn't you come? You could have kept him from dying. 
Look at Mary saying the same thing in verse 32. When Mary came to Jesus, she saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Same thing. You could have stopped this. Jump to verse 37. This is what some of the surrounding people in the community said. Some of them said to him, Could not this man, Jesus, who opened the eyes of the blind man, have kept this man also from dying? Do you sense their confusion, their frustration? This doesn't make any sense. What is he doing? Why wouldn't he solve this problem for us? Doesn't he care? Of course, the preceding verse was that he did care. And some of the people observed he did love him because he was weeping over Lazarus' death. So it's like this interesting, almost perplexing mix of emotions and feelings and interpretations of what's happening here. But in it all, Jesus is up to something amazing, something amazing, something that we need, we all need from him. But for a moment, just appreciate their confusion. So backing up again, when Jesus enters the scene and he begins to interact with Martha and Mary, he, he right away as he enters the scene where death has occurred and people are mourning and grieving, right away, notice, notice the proclamations he makes beginning in verse 23. Jesus said to her, that's Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she answered him, yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. In this setting, in this sort of dark, dismal setting, Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. Earlier, we saw where Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and then as evidence of that, he took a man who had been born blind and gave him his sight, just like that. Here he says, I am the resurrection and the life, and he's about to prove it. He's about to demonstrate it by giving life back to Lazarus. So he proclaims that, and then let's look at the actual resurrection so look forward at uh, verse 38 so we're jumping forward a little bit verse 38 this is where he comes to the tomb it says so jesus again being deeply moved within remember earlier we say it almost seems like he doesn't care oh he cares very much in fact this term has to do with like his determination to do something about this problem of death So it says, being deeply moved within, he came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the sea, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench for he's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Jesus then raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. So here we have Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and people coming to believe in him. He said he's the resurrection and the life and he proved he's the resurrection and the life right before their very eyes and they see his glory and they believe. In fact, he says, did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? That's exactly what's happening is they're seeing the glory of God and they're believing. And it it would have been amazing. Don't, Don't you wish you could have been there? Any one of us would have loved to have been there to be able to witness that display of power and grace. Frankly, along with that, we can easily overlook it, but the fact that Jesus cared, the fact that Jesus cried, he wept, that he loved this man and he loved this family and he cared about what they were going through, he was sympathizing. I mean, it's a, it's a marvelous story. It's an amazing story. And there's even more to it in terms of what is really happening here with glory. Because as we've been saying, this has something to do 
with God's glory. Something very important to do with it. And it begins with what we humans do with God's glory. This is so important. Please track with me on this, okay? When we think about death, a part of life that none of us like, we all have people that we've lost and we are grieving over, as we said earlier. We all know that we have an expiration date, that we are on this conveyor belt moving toward our own death, and there's no stopping that. We know that. However old or young you are in here, we know that's the case. That's true. We're all fragile. We're all mortal like that. That's true. Why does death even happen in the first place? Do you know that has something very important to do with what we humans do with glory? It helps explain why death even happens in the first place. And for us to understand this, we've got to go all the way back to the beginning, to Adam and Eve. Now we're going to turn there, but don't do it quite yet. Because you might think you're going back to Genesis, but you're not. You're actually turning forward to Romans. I want you to go to Romans 1 with me, okay? Go to Romans chapter 1. This is where the Apostle Paul talks about the realities of human fallenness and human fragility from the creation, from the beginning. In this section, he does not explicitly mention Adam and Eve, but he does say this is the way it's been from the very beginning, from creation forward. And I want us to notice what this says about our heart condition and what we do with glory. And then in a few minutes, we'll consider what God does with glory to rescue us. So Romans 1 We're just going to read verses 20 through 23, and we're going to notice this topic of glory here and the connection between glory, what we do with it, and our death. Verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, this is everybody, even though people know God, It says, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. Now, in my translation, they did not honor him as God, but in the margin it says, could be translated glorify. Depending on what translation you have, it may say, they did not glorify him as God. There's that term glory. Do you see that? They did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but became futile in their speculations. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And exchanged, here it is again, exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. So first of all, notice they did not glorify God, which is to say they did not appreciate the greatness, the value of their God. They didn't, they minimized his worth. And it's easy to say they minimized his worth, but we all minimize his worth. We all do it. We all fail to honor him as he deserves to be honored. That's just the reality. All of us, every human being, from the beginning of time till today, all of us. And when it says, secondly, notice when it says, we exchange the glory of the incorruptible God, I want you to hear it this way. And your translation may translate it this way. Exchange the glory of the imperishable God, which is another way of saying the glory of the undying God. Which is another way of saying, God is life. He has always been, he will always be. God doesn't die. Only through Jesus in human form can he experience death in that sense in time and space. But God is alive and always has been and always will be. He's the undying God. And yet what we humans tragically do, the tragic exchange that we are all guilty of from the very beginning till now, from the beginning of our lives to the end, we are all still guilty of this. We exchange the glory of the undying God for the lesser forms of dying men and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Corruptible is my translation. could be perishable. It, it's literally dying. We, we, we value that which is dying and perishing over the one who is everlasting. We, as a friend, uh, I think Robert might be in here somewhere. I think I saw him earlier. Robert and I were talking recently, and he said, you know, we just cling to the dust We do. We cling to the dust and we descend back to the dust. This is what it is. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Some of you have heard that in a memorial service or in a setting like that. This is where it all began. This is the human problem. This is Paul, the the divinely inspired cardiologist, saying this is the human heart problem left to ourselves. This is what we are like. 
And it's all because we have blinders to and a minimization of His glory. We just don't see it for what it is. And that's why, through the Gospel and what we learn in the New Testament and what we see even in this story, we see that God is, is going to show us. He's going to show us His glory. Because that's what we need the most. You know, God could have said, uh, turn back to John 11, He could have said, hey, uh, and the expression like, you, you made your bed, now what? Yeah, lay in it, lie in it, somebody said. Either way, no one knows how that verb is supposed to be conjugated. <laughs> you made your bed, lie in it, right? You made your dust bed or your death bed, now lie in it. God could have said that. Okay, you pick corruptible, perishable. You reject me, you're on your own. Have it your way. Could have said that. In fact, deal with the death that's a consequence of that. That's all you then. If that's what you think, if that's what you think you can handle, go for it. But he didn't. And this story is evidence that he didn't say that. That he comes, that he cares, that he loves, and that he solves the problem that we started, that we created. He solves the problem. And he does it by revealing his glory. So this is why he says, did I not say to you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? This is the glory of God. In what sense? In, in, in almost, I mean, in every sense. I mean, in the, first of all, he's the one who can speak words, Lazarus, come forth, and he says it, and it happens. None of us have that ability. None of us have that power. There's a lot of things in my life I would have said, uh, let that not happen. <laughs> turn that around, and it would immediately turn around. That's not the way life works for us. God has the power. He just says, Lazarus, get up. And he gets up. So there's a demonstration of his power. There's a demonstration of his love. We read verse after verse. Jesus, and Pastor, Pastor Rob last week, the whole message, Jesus loved him and loved this family. Jesus cares. He sympathizes. What other God would allow themselves to, to cry? He cries. He feels the grief. Shortest verse in the Bible. Verse 35, Jesus wept. This is all glory. It's been glory from the beginning. John's gospel begins, the word became flesh, dwelt among us, we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what the coming of Jesus is about. That's why at Christmas time we sing songs about his glory. What's the one? Gloria, right? In excelsis Deo, right? The glory of God, right? It's, there's Rob's always saying, you need to sing from the pulpit sometime. I don't know why he wants me to do it. I think I just did by accident. That wasn't planned. But we think of even the, the shepherds and the angels. Glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. This is the arrival of glory, and it's, a, it's, it's glory being displayed from beginning to end. Everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, is a way of God saying, look, you left to yourself would never pick me, but I pick you. I'm coming for you. I'm coming to awaken you to myself. I'm going to draw you back to myself. I'm going to open your eyes. I'm going to raise you from the dead. I'm going to solve your greatest problems. I'm going to take care of your sin, and I'm going to take care of your death, and you're going to live forever with me. And that's glory, and we see that, and we say, yes, thank you, God. And that's now the reversal of that curse problem, the reversal of that tragic exchange we're in sin, we forfeit the glory of God and all of that and in grace, God gives himself back to us. It's truly remarkable. It's truly generous and gracious in the most amazing of ways and that's why at Christmas we give gifts, gifts that are undeserved and unpaid for and unmerited. We just give gifts as an expression of a God who just gives and gives and gives and gives and even when we spit in his face, he still gives. How do you feel about keeping people on your list who have hurt you or offended you? I mean, do you keep them on? Oh, I'm going to get them something really nice this year. Is that the natural tendency? No. Yet with God, even when we are at our worst, he gives us his best. It's amazing. It's amazing. And I got I to gotta just highlight how awesome that is. Uh, and I'm going to create a contrast for a minute. I wasn't sure if I would mention this or not, but I'm going to uh, because something I, I was reading recently, I, I was listening to an interview between a, a Christian apologist named John Lennox. I really appreciate him. He's a very intelligent mathematician and he's a Christian apologist. 
and he was interacting with another gentleman, and this topic came up about a, uh, something called transhumanism. Now, some of you right away, you hear transhumanism, and you're thinking of like the transgender and sexuality issues. This may have some relation to that, but it's not technically that, okay? Transhumanism has to do with like people today believing that, hey, we're so sophisticated. We've moved beyond need for tradition and religion. We're so sophisticated. We're so intelligent. We can, we can solve our problems through technology, through artificial intelligence. We can, we can reverse aging problems. We can solve some huge problems. And so they were talking about this topic and was mentioned this author and this book. And I, so I looked up the book and I read part of it. And the book is called Homo Deus, and it's written by a guy named Yuval Noah Harari. He was a Jewish scholar. He teaches at uh, Hebrew University. I believe it's in Jerusalem. He's a renowned scholar. He's a New York Times bestseller. And he's a believer in this idea called transhumanism, that we can have these amazing advancements. The title of the book itself means human God. And in this book, this author argues that uh, we don't need religion anymore. And this is what he says. I want you just to hear it as, again, a contrast with the glory and the wonder of the gospel that we are being amazed by here. So just hear what he says as a backdrop, okay? He says, in the 21st century, humans are likely to make a serious bid for immortality. We are constantly reminded that human life is the most sacred thing in the universe. Everybody says this, teachers in schools, politicians in parliaments, lawyers in courts, and actors on theater stages. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted by the UN after the Second World War, which is perhaps the closest thing we have to a global constitution, categorically states that the right to life is humanity's most fundamental value. Since death clearly violates this right, death is a crime against humanity, and we ought to wage total war against it. Throughout history, religions and ideologies did not sanctify life itself. They always sanctified something above or beyond earthly existence and were consequently quite tolerant of death. And he's, of course, critiquing, again, Christianity and other religions as well. And he says this, Modern science and modern culture have an entirely different take on life and death. They don't think of death as a metaphysical mystery, and they certainly don't view death as a source of life's meaning. Rather, for modern people, death is a technical problem that we can and should solve. How exactly do humans die? Medieval fairy tales depicted death as a figure in a hooded black cloak, his hand gripping a large sickle. A man lives his life worrying about this and that, running here and there, when suddenly the grim reaper appears before him, taps him on the shoulder with a bony finger and says, Come! And the man implores, no, please, wait just a year or a month or a day. But the hooded figure hisses, no, you must come now. And this is how we die, from a medieval perspective. He says, in reality, however, humans don't die because of a figure in a black cloak or because God decreed it or because mortality is an essential part of some great cosmic plan. Humans always die due to some technical glitch. The heart stops pumping blood, the main artery is clogged by fatty deposits, cancerous cells spread in the liver, germs multiply in the lungs, and what is responsible for all these technical problems? Other technical problems. The heart stops pumping blood because not enough oxygen reaches the heart muscle. Cancerous cells spread because a chance genetic mutation rewrote their instructions. Germs settled in my lungs because someone sneezed on the subway. And here's the point. Nothing metaphysical at all about it, which is to say nothing spiritual about it. It's all just a technical problem. And every technical problem has a technical solution. This is the la- I, find, I promise you this is the last of it. We don't need to wait for the second coming in order to overcome death. A couple of geeks in a lab can do it. Yeah, wow, right? So this is um, FYI. This is, this is where our world is going, okay? This is the mindset being increasingly embraced. It is, it is humanism. It's like if we reject God, reject the things of God, what are we left with? Well, humans and our supposed pseudo-sophistication and what we think we can do. The reality is I don't see any human scientist even solving the technical problems of death. That aside, let's just say, let's just presuppose that that could happen. Let's just suppose, like, for example, in the garden, God never barred them from the tree of life and allowed them to live forever in sin and depravity. Let's just suppose, going back to the scientific kind of way of thinking, okay, they solved the death problem and everyone's now immortal. So nothing to worry about anymore, right? Wrong. Life is still a miserable, perpetual flurry of sin and greed and jealousy and, by the way, murder and all sorts of other things. 
Because you see, our problem is not just a physical problem. Like it's a problem, it's a big problem. It's not like the main problem. The main problem is a heart problem. And the beginning of the heart problem or the spiritual problem is that we just don't see the value of our maker who gives meaning and purpose to all this. Who invests all this with the significance that we so desperately need. God has done that and he's revealed himself to us through his word and through history coming in space and time to the person of Jesus to live in this world, to experience all the forms of suffering that we experience and every temptation we experience and yet to conquer death and to tell us a story about resurrection and to say you're part of it because of my love for you now. That's pretty awesome. That's substantial. That's something to hold on to. We need glory. We love glory. We're made for glory, and yet we just keep exchanging it. We're made to see and value greatness. This is why we we love to watch amazing athletes or musicians or entertainers or even impressive, charismatic politicians because we're just drawn to things that are big or seem beyond us or seem larger than life. But it's all just a tragic exchange if we don't see that it all comes from the God who is above it all and made it all and sustains it all. It's like rays of the sun coming from the source. The sun is the source. And so we're warmed by the rays and we're given life by the rays of the sun. But it's the sun that is responsible and behind the sun is the God who created the sun and the God who created you and the God who created me. And he says, look, death has to be part of this life because you're failing to see glory and that's what you were made for and I'm going to come and I'm going to rescue you and I'm going to open your eyes to see glory. And that's what this story is about. It's about glory. It's not just about a guy who is dead and who got up from his death, though that's amazing. It's also about glory, seeing the God behind that activity who is gracious and kind and sympathetic and loving and merciful and who despite our plight, which is our own, our own cause of our own plight, who loves us, gives himself for us, allows himself through the person of Jesus even to experience the horrors of death so that he might three days later rise from the dead and say, because I live, you shall live also. It's about glory. His glory is on display here. It is awesome. Every one of his miracles throughout the story of the Gospels, every one of his miracles is somehow, some way, conveying life. It's speaking life, it's imparting life, it's taking sick, dying people and reversing that so that their life is restored physically. It's, it's a dead person, like here, being raised from the dead. It's life. It's all pointing to spiritual life, which comes as we see who our God is. As our eyes are open to be amazed by his glory, as our hearts are brought from the irreverence of Romans 1 to the, to the reverence of Romans 2 and 3 and 4, and we start to see the unfolding of this plan where God comes and rescues us and shows us how great he is in power and sovereignty and omniscience and omnipotence and omnipresence and all of that, and in all of that packaged in the form starting with just a little baby boy in innocence and frailty and growing older and growing in wisdom and knowledge and understanding and in favor with God and man and then serving and loving and giving and then moving forward, just giving and giving and giving and giving and the people just, some of them believing, some of them here believing and others saying, no, we'll have nothing with this. We have nothing to do with him and putting him to death and he just lets them put him to death so that one, God's demands may be satisfied, sin may be paid for, blood may be shed that we may be cleansed and atoned for, and that three days later he might rise from the dead and say, hey, by the way, I've solved your biggest problem. You're welcome. It's pretty awesome, right? It's a story you're a part of. This stuff offers you no story. It's just a bunch of egotism, men passing glory back and forth, which earlier in John's gospel, Jesus said that's what men love to do. But there's no hope in that. There's no life in that. And we have here a message of hope and life. And then we think, okay, Lazarus died. Four days later, Jesus raised him from the dead. It's four days. I mean, when you're going through it, four days seems like an eternity, but four days is probably a lot less than the amount of time some of you have been grieving. Days, months, years maybe. But do you know that the fact that 
it was a shorter period of time then than it has been for you doesn't mean that resurrection is any less certain. It is a certainty. Jesus is saying here, I'm the resurrection and the life. Where I want and when I want, I just raise people from the dead. Just do it. Now in this, as Martha mentioned, we wait. We wait for the day. We wait for the day when he comes back and there's a final resurrection and he allows us to die and for time to go on. However, it does not mean that there is not a resurrection waiting for us. Scripture tells us through and through that there is. Jesus came to live out the reality of giving us hope and himself going through death and rising victorious. I remember years ago talking to a friend who's uh, kind of agnostic and he was saying, you know, can't you, you just you, you talk with certainty sometimes. You, you talk, Jeff, kind of certainly, you know, with certainty about things of the afterlife. And, and he's like, you know, you can't prove it. And I said, you're you're right. From your like from a scientific evidence, as far as what is deemed evidence from a scientific perspective, you're you're right. I can't prove it in that same way that you understand proof. You're right. And so we're talking back and forth. And he said, you know, but if if someone like went and came back, maybe then. Maybe then I would, I would be convinced. Well, he went and he came back. And we have, re- we have record of it. And more importantly than just even the record of it, we have from cover to cover in this book the revelation of not just the reality of the Creator's existence, but the heart and the character of that God. And that's the main issue. He reveals himself to us and we say, huh. And of course, as followers of Christ, we've said, yes, <laughs> thank you, Right? But by and large, and apart from God's grace and help and his spirit, that's what the human condition does with such things, with God's grace and glory. But we have, thankfully, because of his great love for us, not of any of our own doing, not anything to pat ourselves on the back over or to boast over, simply to say, thank you, God, you've been kind to me. Thank you for this glory story and inviting me into it and opening my eyes to see how great you are. We can say things like, God, forgive me for all the ways that I still put the things of creation over you, the creator. I'm all, you know, I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. God, I'm sorry. And help me. Help me to see your value. Help me to see your worth. Help me to experience the life that occurs when I'm believing in you. Help me, God. We say that. And uh, close with this. I'm going to turn to Revelation. You can if you want. Revelation 21. And this is what we have awaiting us. Revelation 21, verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your faithful and true words. Thank you for your care and concern for the predicament we find ourselves in. All of us here this morning, whatever our age, God, we all confess to you together that we are fragile and frail and mortal and, and we confess to you as well that, God, we understand that we are consigned to that state because of what we have done with your glory. We are constantly chasing counterfeits. Meanwhile, you are in pursuit of us. You love us. You have mercy on us. You have good plans for even the hardest things that we go through. You've promised, promised us that the, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed to us in the future. Help us to wait for that revelation, to wait patiently, faithfully. Help us to trust you. 
Help us to be beacons of light and hope to others around us. Help us to be servants of others around us, getting the message out, not not one-upping people of other perspectives, but proclaiming truth in love. Help us, God. Thank you for this amazing story of the raising of Lazarus. Thank you for what it means for us today, thousands of years later, but still living with the same earthly realities of difficulty and death. Thank you for the hope that it gives us. Thank you for your, sol- your solution to our human problem. Thank you for Jesus and what he's done for us. Help us as we move into the Christmas season even to be uh, freshly prepared to appreciate what the gift of Jesus means to us. And we might worship him and serve others in his name. So thank you again for this time this morning. Thank you for being the one who makes all sad things to be untrue in the end. Thank you for what you're up to. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand once again, please, as we close our time of worship and song this morning. We'll sing together, glorious and mighty.